Hi, I'm John, the Anti-Usury Engineer, and today we're going to talk about the message that is actually repeated in the Bible from politicleague.com. And we'll talk about why and how usury is imposed across the world by Boulder Dad. Then financial crisis is usury the problem at Conspiracy Review. Then we have sacred local economy at OJ Post. And then we'll be looking at uh, Nehemiah Aids the Poor from Benches Clear to Blogspot. And Nehemiah chapter 5 verses 1 and 2 on how he talked the nobles and the rulers into abolishing interest rates. November 24th, 2008, the message that is actually repeated throughout the Bible is the title from politiclyklyk.com. And uh, the article says, there is one thing that the Bible mentions over and over, and it isn't about gay marriage or abortion. Usury, the rich making money off the poor. Then God went on to explain that the reason the Bible exists is to give people shared traditions to focus on, gather inspiration from. He, said he purposely allowed conflicting traditions to be placed near, nearly side by side. So anyway, I made a comment and I said, absolutely, taking from the poor to give to the rich is the death of civilizations. Of course, getting rid of usury would be the main issue in all good religions. And of course, usury again is interest on money something that doesn't have babies. If it has babies, then you're worried about excessive interest, taking too many of the babies. November 27th on Usury 2008 by Boulder Dash at salonesoterica.wordpress.com An article why and how usury has been imposed across the world. Throughout history, while usury and all the things which have to be involved with it have evolved amongst many conflicting beliefs, usury's consequences can only be consistent with the process interest imposes upon a monetary system. Interest inherently and irreversibly multiplies debt so long as its subjects maintain a vital circulation. Usury thus requires ever more usurious sums of interest from hapless subjects, even to the inevitable fatality of their industry. <laughs> no more efficient and thorough tool ever existed to usurp government, to dispossess countries of their wealth, to compromise proven principles, and to corrupt and divide people. Nor could any object more so require accomplishing all these things. The origins of usury are ancient enough to be forgiven, forbidden not only by the Old Testament, but also by three major religions derived from the book. The Knights Templar operated an early international bank, although it is not clear their bank was ever intended for the pervasive quasi-government role of the modern banks which have imposed across the world. The purpose of the recent jar, of course, is stupendous unearned gain. The medium is the subverted, privatized currencies of the world. The private Bank of England, therefore, would be a forerunner of the recent design, if indeed, as our parable of perfect economy tells us, it turned the armies of the mother country England into an, the instrument by which its usury would be imposed upon the colonies. True. So I sent a comment on the 27th, and I pointed out, Shift B inflation from Termel's miracle experience equation exposes the big lie of economics. Interest does not fight inflation. Inflation is not more money chasing the goods, shift A. It's shift B, the same money chasing less goods after foreclosure caused by interest. The usury, December 2nd, 2008. Financial crisis is usury the problem. Usury is referred to in the Bible, granted that's an English translation from the 17th century of the original texts, but is the idea of making money out of money the root problem of financial woes in the stock market? Note we're talking about stock market here, not those fancy derivatives and other exotic financial instruments. As soon as money is conjured up out of thin air, new chips, extrapolated by computer programs and securitized into real money, chips issued in exchange for collateral, okay by me, an impression is created that something has been made out of nothing. Well, no, it, chips were issued out of nothing, but they were backed up by the collateral in the cage, giving them value as receipts for collateral. 
What a shame that all those intelligent people who work in the financial markets couldn't be employed into something more useful. Say being retrained to develop 21st century fuel technology. Usury, damned in the Bible. So I added on December 3rd, Ezekiel condemned those who take usury or excessive interest. Interest is on cows and can be paid after they have calves. But usury is interest on money and because interest has no babies, it therefore creates a death, gamble, mort, gage between participants. From www.ojpost.com, O-J-A-I-Post.com, and the article is titled, Heart of the Goddess Moon, How Do We Sing Sacred Local Economy? So I sent a post and I said, you can't have a sacred local economy if you don't have a working sacred local currency to trade with. U.S. Treasury greenbacks to pay for new projects, collateral backing up the chips, would do the job fine, or small denomination state bonds. Comment number six, posted December the 2nd. Hey, from Benches Cleared at Blogspot.com. So, an article about Nehemiah 5, the most important verses in the Old Testament, about Nehemiah, the guy who actually talked his rich civilization into giving up usury. I guess I'm trying to pull a Nehemiah move by asking the World Social Forum and the World Economic Forum, like Nehemiah did to say, you're charging usury, let the exacting the usury stop and give them back their stuff. And if they do it now, like they did it then, then we can all go back to work and build heaven on earth. So he points out that from Nehemiah 5, there were rich people in the land Rich people who apparently made a lot of money during the exile or had returned earlier and established businesses. These rich people were predatory lenders who were exacting usury, which means interest. The poor in Israel were slaves to the rich. This is not the way things were intended to be, with the rich getting richer and the destitute mortgaging their land and even their children to square up their payments. So Nehemiah calls a meeting and basically rips these people a new one. And if I ever got invent, invited to speak to these two fora, I would rip them one too. So vehement were Nehemiah's admonishings that the wealthy fellows were moved to give it back and additionally not charge any more interest. Nehemiah held them to this with an oath. He demonstrates God's feelings about rich folk exacting usury on poor folk by standing up, shaking out the folds of his robe and declaring that God would shake out of his house those who didn't keep that oath. It wasn't enough for Nehemiah to just say these things without being an example. He lived it out. He didn't eat the luxury food appointed to him as governor. Well, nothing wrong with that. He didn't wall himself off in the safety of some remote tent while the wall was being built. He got right in there, got his hands dirty and lived it. God's ways for dealing with the poor are pretty evident. They shouldn't be taken advantage of in any way. So poor need a credit line. And don't forget Isaiah 55. You who are hungry and have no money, come buy and eat. Well, how do you buy when you got no money? Credit's okay. It's only the usury on the credit that's bad. So, but these were the still being enslaved for lack of power. These poor people were trying. They weren't lazy, good for nothings. God would throw people out of his house if they didn't stop being mean to the poor. So I commented and I sent off my poem about Nehemiah 5, the whole thing in verse. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, if there's anything you can do to influence the Tufora, give it a try. January 1st, another one, Nehemiah 5, reads the whole chapter and says my thoughts. This is at Shimmershine.net. And after the Nehemiah 5, this is my thoughts. The people working on the wall all began to complain to Nehemiah about the excessive taxes they were having to pay to the nobles of the country just in order to get grain. All they had was mortgage to them and they were no better than slaves on their own land. I like how the text first says about Nehemiah's reaction. When I heard their outcry on these charges, I was very angry. But then Nehemiah takes it a step further. And here is a lesson for my quick temper. I pondered them in my mind. 
So Nehemiah took the time to ponder, to let the heat of the moment pass, and to form a plan when his mind was unclouded by anger. He confronts the nobles who own the slaves and accuse them of buying more just so that they could offer them up to be redeemed. He also accused them of usury, which was morally wrong. He shows them how they look to others and asks them, shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? Two full reasons there, both of which hit home with the nobles and leaders. They told Nehemiah they would return the excessive payments and not demand anything more. This was good, but not quite enough. Nehemiah called together the priests and made the nobles and officials take an oath to do what they promised. Nothing like making it public to keep them accountable. I see a government lesson here, one that has not been learned. As for me, I see a clear warning to watch my motives, to only do what I believe God wants me to do and do it with my heart. And of course, here too, I cut out my Bible poem on Nehemiah and sent it to him. 